Yes, free speech Fridays. The half hour in my show where we pick a couple of, well, not quite so random New Zealanders and we have a yarn, uh, an unfettered yarn about what's been going on in the country this week. Joining us for the first time today uh, from Auckland is a young entrepreneur, uh, political hopeful. Uh, She was a National Party candidate last election uh, and all round uh, good person, Nuanthi Samarakone. Uh, Nui, lovely to have you with us. Welcome to the platform. Hello, Sean. Lovely to lovely to chat. Thank All right. you so much. Happy and uh, to balance her youthful enthusiasm uh, as a Free Speech Friday virgin, we have old Tusker and regular appearer on the segment, uh, Boise, Alistair Boyce from the Back Backbencher Pub in Wellington. Boise, how you going, mate? G'day, Sean. Trust you're not too grumpy this morning. Oh, no, I was. I having a bit of a moment this morning. It's Friday. It's been a bit of a week. Uh, I'll look, guys, to send you a soothing text. All right, I might pop in for a beer later on this afternoon, actually. That sounds a better idea. That's a much better idea to um, assuage my, my troubled heart. All right, guys, I just want to kick off very quickly with something that wasn't on the agenda. It all sort of happened yesterday and busy and kicking off. Um, Reserve Bank Governor uh, up 75 basis points. He is basically admitting he is trying to talk the country in a recession into a recession to stop inflation. Nui, this doesn't feel good, and it feels particularly bad for a government that will be in the middle of recession when it goes to the polls next year. I know, I know. It's it's just not going to be, it's not the right optics, but we've still got um, the finance minister still telling us that it's it's all good. You know, we've got a cost of living crisis, but we're all going to be all right about it. But we know we're not, Sean. Yeah, what does it mean for the sectors that you work in, Nui, the prospect of recession? Yeah, look, I think um, if I look at the tourism sector aside, I think they're going to be hopefully okay, but I think the spend across locally is going to is gonna plummet, even though that those are the numbers we anticipated will go up. So hopefully with the borders being remain open, we'll, we'll sort of keep driving some value there. Tech won't suffer so much, I don't think, mm-hmm. uh, particularly with the export piece. But I think if you're thinking about health, um, well-being, um, you know, and just, I guess, you know, we're thinking about trade and commodities, uh, that is just going to have a massive hit. No one's going to spend money. And that's what he's basically come out and said, right? Yeah. Try and reduce spending amongst all of us. So, yeah, yeah that is going to be hard hit. Boise, less people buying pints at the back venture. Yeah. Um, or fewer, I should say. Yeah, oh, well, our market's very government dependent um, and they're still working from home. So we sort of have a massive spike Tuesday through Thursday. That's not going to change. The government sector's still going to be there if they come to work and if we actually get any productivity out of them because uh, the outcomes are all awful. As for this uh, smiling uh, finance minister, he's a smiling assassin because underneath he's just um, destroying and dislocating uh, lives and businesses, small businesses all around the country, and very much so in Wellington CBD, which is under another assault from the local council who are uh, about to rip up all the pavements on top of all the pipes that needed repairing, and uh, you've got uh, thousands of, of businesses affected throughout the uh, CBD and arterial routes um, because all the car parks are turning into cycleways. Yeah, it took me an hour and a half to get from my home in Evans Bay Parade to the waterfront, um, to the Portrait Gallery last night. It was ridiculous, all because of roadworks. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's going to get worse, Sean. Yeah, but I'm presuming none of us are going to have to really sweat over our mortgage repayments during the time of recession and while interest rates go up, but we're not probably, let's be frank, we're not like the average New Zealander who is going to do it tough, Nui. Well, Sean, that is right and it's also wrong because if you... If, I mean, I still go... When I go to the pump, I mean, I've got a hybrid and it still costs me a lot more, $50 more than it used to cost me. And you sort of look at that and you think, you know... The optics of it, sure, maybe at the surface, but it does all start to add up. And I think the biggest crunch here is us not being able to spend on things we want to spend to keep fueling the economy. Because, you know, when we start to reduce our spend, um, it's going to start hurting the other businesses that would normally be supporting us and whatever. I I get you. And I think the building and infrastructure space is going to really get a slam now. Yeah. Um, All right. Uh, I want to move on now to a story... Uh, that I think has affected, and the more I think about it, more has affected me. And look, murders are 
We have 50 or 60 murders a year in New Zealand. They come, they go. But this latest death, the stabbing of this um, young man, also a dairy worker uh, in Auckland, um, after this, this robbery of a dairy, I don't know, it just seems to me to focus all the general concern we've had about law and order, lawlessness, the issue of boot camps, what to do with young offenders, the Ram Raiders, it's all come to this horrible, horrible punctuation point, Nui. And I don't know, for the first time, I do feel hawkish and angry about the state of crime and law and order in this country. Yeah, sure. And look, I'm, I've got a mix of emotions when I read that and saw that. Um, one is, yeah, anger, anger, but also a huge level of disappointment to think that we have now ultimately come to this. I and mean, we've got a murder scene in a dairy shop, you know, in a corner shop that we would never have thought even two years ago. I mean, yes, we'd have the, odd, we'd have the robberies, right? But at knife point, um, but not this. And the challenge I see with all the, you know, military camps and the boot camps we're all talking about and, you know, points around Kumbaya and stuff is you can take someone out of a setting and try and support them and mentor them and go through a rehab program for 12 months. But essentially when those individuals, and look, I've done a lot of work with youth, as you know, in the education space, but when you take them back into the environment they come from and, and, and whether it, it, they're all impressionable as well when you're thinking about those age groups, we're not going to solve this problem by just sending them out to a camp. Yeah. We're really not. Yeah. We're really not. We're not. We're not. We need to start thinking about a whānau centered approach and, and a lot of that psychosocial and a lot of that community based. It isn't about the individual per se who is offending, sadly. Boy, see, I was looking at the back bench, so that'd be hard to ram raid. You're a pretty solid building. Uh, back in the old days, uh, we would. No, we were never going to ram raid uh, and on us, obviously, but um, I've got some. Um, uh, local, my local dairy owner, Superette owner, and my local garage and NIO, uh, they both uh, park their vehicles religiously in front of their um, uh, their shops at night. Uh, they live in fear of it. Uh, my um, lovely uh, Superette, uh, Sri Lankan lady who I've known for 30 years, she's chased burglars down the road who have come in and just stolen a bottle of something because they think they can. Uh, it's a cultural problem now in this country that we've got a whole generation growing up who do not fear any consequences and they do not have hope and aspiration to pull themselves out. Jeez, I worry the about your super they are living in. Yeah, I worry about Pardon? your superette owner because what happens if the, one of the people she chases turns around and pulls a knife? That's a recipe. Well, if, if you don't believe there are going to be consequences for the person who's just stolen something off you and. All these small business owners are doing it really, really hard. But they live on the edge and they're getting by week to week. A lot of uh, the small business owners now are up to three months out on payments. They're only just getting through and surviving in the Wellington CBD. Uh, so they're, they're on the edge and it's a tipping point. And that you get to the point, well, I'm prepared to face it, you know. like So you've got a diminutive... Uh, yeah, wonderful person um, chasing um, a retrobate down the street over over a, a, a bottle of uh, uh, bourbon or something. Do you know what I mean? Nui, I have postulated this morning that perhaps the way to really stop this at the core is not to concentrate on the offender after they've been caught, to, but to look at what Giuliani did in New York in the 80s when they were having a crime wave, and that is you just clean up your streets. And I look at Manor Street in Wellington, we've had, talked about Fenton Street in Rotorua, Queen Street in Auckland. Uh, you don't live in a country where it's okay for pe antisocial people to be wandering the streets. You do not tolerate antisocial behaviour. And you teach people there are uh, consequences for bad action in every aspect of our society. Surely that's the answer long term. Oh, look, I, I absolutely agree, and I think that model works, right? In, in in growing big cities, I think the challenge we've got, though, Sean, is we've got a we've got a government who is in denial of some of these core issues. We've got a government who is so soft on crime; it's it's, un, it's unfathomable. But also, you know, we've got massive drug issues and gang issues in this country that sort of almost create a a culture where it's permissible 
So you walk up and down Queen Street today, and you know, as, as you know, I live in the Viaduct. I mean, yeah. it's a very unsavoury place to be at times. And even during the day, during peak hour, um, you know, work hours, uh, I I don't feel safe on yeah. Sundays. And 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 you know, on a Tuesday to Thursday, the the city is generally bustling, but Mondays and Fridays, people yeah. are working from home or they're taking a long weekend, and it it's just not okay. But we don't have enough police either, right? Mm. And then. We've created these pedestrian walkways around the city too and cycle lanes for Africa that no one actually uses, but mind yeah. you. Um, so we've had our stones pulled out and re- re-put in there. But just my point here is we can't have service staff, which include police, patrolling because yeah. there's no way to get you in You need police on bikes in Auckland, um, in shorts, <laughs> like that. they have in Miami and places <laughs> like that. Police on bikes on the Gold Coast. <laughs> Um, that's if we have any right. Yeah. You mentioned something, and it's the problem of the platform in Manor Street, Wellington. Um, a lot of student accommodation and a lot of hotel and motel accommodation has been repurposed for emergency housing because the government didn't deal with the housing crisis. And those now become concentrations and focal points for the antisocial. Um, and that's certainly the problem down at the viaduct. And, and Boise... You have had an intense experience with this, with the parliamentary protest, but I don't know if you've been down Manor Street, Wellington lately, Boise, and seen yeah, what I, I, wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't choose to go down there, and I wouldn't want my daughter to go down there, and she doesn't, and she doesn't go to Courtney Place either. It's a, it's a massive problem, and, and you're right. The, the streets need to be cleaned up, and um, we need a bit of tough love um, going on. Um, and this has been unfor- this unfortunate uh, murder is, is, was highly predictable. It was just going to happen. Yeah, sitting there uh, waiting the to happen. Is, yes, it was. I mean, you know, I, 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 I fail to be surprised. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm shocked and angered, mm. and it's another tipping point, yeah. and it's really hard to contain. Yeah. Um, but, but, but let's be honest, and Nui, let's be honest, boot camps is just a piece of political rhetoric designed to grab a headline and, and get oh, some Houston. some votes out of an issue that is much more serious, complex, and fundamental to our society than that. Hugely. Look, and, and look, it, it, it proved success when John Key came in, right? It, it earned a lot of those centre-right votes. I don't think this, this, this cannot just be about earning those votes back. This is about actually what are we going to instill and do in our communities? And I think we need to look at a local-to-local local approach as well because I think that way you, you, you're driving um, respect, you're driving a level of role modelling, which I think is really important here. And I think we've got to get some of the schools involved to help us back this as well, particularly with those 10 to 17-year-olds, um, to try and entrench education in there as, as the primary option, if anything. But if they're not, if they're not wanting to stay in schools, then we've got to start being really creative about training, uh, retraining those young people into giving them some other options and not having them stay at home um, in, in spaces and places that are just uh, not right because, as I said, they are of a very impressionable age. Yeah. And sending them away and bringing them... And then they're obviously going to return back home. What do you think is going to happen in 12 months? Yeah. You know, I think the stats were only 15% were successful from the initial boot camp that we had. Yeah. And it cost us a quarter of a million dollars to oh, hire. Yeah. But I, I've, been, right. I've been looking and talking to people about this thing called the Limited Service Volunteer Scheme, which isn't yes. necessary for people who have fallen foul of the law. It's more like a fence at the top of the cliff. And boy, the people I, I've talked to who have taken part in it, And the people I know who have been involved in it say it's awesome for identifying at-risk young people or people who are just, you know, starting to go off the rails. It's a six-week course. And apparently it really does work. It's changed people's lives. And I really like the idea of that LSV scheme um, being used a little bit more. And the idea surely is not to put criminals back, uh, young criminals on the straight and narrow, it's to stop them going off the straight and narrow in the first place, isn't it? That yes, really it should be the should should be the aim. Uh, all and right, and look, taking yeah, and taking yeah. their families along with them as well, Sean. Yeah, yeah look, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to be brutally honest. I, you know, I grew up uh, in Porirua with a lot of people. You're never going to get their families along. Most of them were doomed, and the best way to, thing to do is get them away from their bloody families. Um, well, then we're going to find to stop them from returning, though, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. 
Um, look, the other issue that's been kicking around we've having, been having, well, not great fun, we've been committed to covering it, is Three Waters Reform, which have now then came back from a select committee. It's now Five Waters. They've gone from co-governance to a limited form of sovereignty for Māori over water assets under certain circumstances. And all this has been so concerning to the Prime Minister, it's still going to get passed under urgency, but the bill is being redrafted during the urgency process. There seems to be a pathological desire to pass this legislation, no matter how bad it is. Uh, I can't quite understand that obsession. Um, do you guys share the concern of many New Zealanders that this water reform is far more an ideological um, exercise than a practical policy reaction to a real problem, Boise? Absolutely. Um, I've got a few major concerns here. It is patently obvious, if you follow the timeline of the interviews last Monday, that the Prime Minister, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and Megan Woods had no idea of the uh, inclusion after the, sub, uh, after the select committee process of geothermal and it uh, looks like we've got another foreshore and seabed uh, water debate coastal, on our coastal hands. Coastal waters, yep. So um, that's been included under stealth, although Mahout has always said that that's been her plan and, and Willie Jack Jackson signalled the whole thing as soon as Winston was out of the way, that they were waiting for Winston to get out of the way. Uh, it, it's a hijack and it's a coup and it's a seed of sovereignty. It's the most divisive thing that's happened in this country since the Springbok tour. Um, and it's not good. It's, uh, so in those submissions to the select committee, the 88,000 su submissions, um, Nanaia Mahuta discounted 80,000 submissions because, in her words, they were only one page long and they were basically all the same. They were all the same because they said no. And that's dismissed in her mind. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. And and the other ones that were more than one page long, oh, they must contain something of substance, not just a straight dismissal. That is the rationale of this government yep. in regard to democracy. Yeah. Nui, do you think the person in the street, do you get excised about this or not? <laughs> Good question. Uh, sure. Yes and no. Look, I think the most... Um, I think the most annoying and most frustrating factor in all of us is I always knew, and I think we always knew, that this was going to get, you know, rolled across regardless of what people felt, what the submission said, what the select committee was going to do. And obviously you know, tweaking the legislation now, uh, even whilst it's all under urgency, to just get it done before Christmas um, is, is just, it was always on the cards. And I, I, I sort of almost feel like, you know, we can, we can debate about it, but the Prime Minister and her caucus just want it done and there's obviously some jobs lined up for people to take this forward in january uh there's money allocated as part of this ideological idea that this needs to happen for the country uh and it's all set up it's all you know everything's being put in place yeah so we can't let pesky old democratic process get in the way of that can we Nui? it's almost like democratic what <laughs> <laughs> Hey, guys, finally, I think the most significant story that I've come across this week, though it is actually three or four weeks old, just mainstream media haven't really pro uh, bothered to report it. The United Nations, the United Nations has halved its climate warming predictions for to the year uh, for, uh, by the end of the century. They've halved them to maybe, they say, 2.5 degrees. Suddenly, the world is not going to end in an apocalyptic fire. Suddenly, even the UN in its own reports is saying we should now move our focus to mitigating and adapting to the not quite so extreme levels of climate change uh, we predict we might undergo. Uh, I've sat there and looked when data, and I mean, Al Gore's predictions are now just so far off the planet, it's not funny. And I just wonder, um, guys, if it's not time that we really sat and had a cup of tea and a little bit of a break and a bicky and thought about just what sort of damage we're doing to our economy, to our farmers, to all sorts of sectors in pursuit of, a poli of policies that may not even be necessary, Nui. 
Yeah, look, I, I, I had to, I, when I read that, when it came out, I did have a bit of a chuckle, I have to admit, Sean, because it was like, really? We've got we've got to this point now after all this, um, all this reporting, all this, this whole push, really, but also the push, and, and as you said, let's take a break, have a cup of tea and a bicky, and, and let's sit down and work out what, what it is that we're destroying. Yeah, I mean, there's no the proof, Louis, by stuff. the way, no proof that anything we've done has changed it. Just the data hasn't been no. brought out by the ap- uh, you know, uh, apocalyptic predictions of climate change scientists. No, not at all. And the irony is, when I read that, you know, what really hit me was the fact that this modest prediction is now based on a business-as-usual policy environment, right? And what that makes me start to think about is, well, in, in that fact, what are we then trying to drive in the next... 18 months or two years in New Zealand alone, that's going to actually cost us millions and possibly billions of dollars in the next five years if we try and just ram through things based on what we initially thought was going to happen uh, and or based on the predictions. Yeah, and, and Alistair, I think we just need to revoke all those stupid local bodies that have got climate change emergencies need to revoke them and the government needs to revoke its climate change emergency. Absolutely. We've got to start again. The, the emissions tax on the rural sector has just got to be gone. And uh, we've got to re-promote our rural sector and our, and our efficiencies of farming and food production that the world needs. Uh, they're, they're changing of their own accord. Um, I, you know, I, I'm like everyone else. We don't want unnecessary pollution in the environment. Provide the market with parameters don't use these ridiculous incentives like subsidising Tesla cars. The electricity infrastructure can't even cope with um, the plethora of um, charges going into people's homes. The grid won't cope with it. We're, we're building pine, pine plantations uh, on the upper levels of our country that suck out all the water so that hydro as well as farm irrigation is being starved. That's incentivised. It's eight to nine times more profitable than marginal farmland, which uh, could uh, grow and uh, have production of food for the world, uh, we've lost sight of the fact that human beings inhabit the world and their health and well-being um, are absolutely paramount in relation to the whole equation. The equation has been debunked. Um, the mainstream media are totally culpable for not just report. They should just be reporting the facts. And then their narrative has to change. Their narrative is appalling. We've got a generation of children. I've got a generation of workers who are, are scared of the world. They think it's coming to an end. Uh, they're all riding their bikes and um, they have no hope of uh, entering our, our socio-economy on the basis of buying a home or participating at any greater level. And we wonder why they don't want to turn up to work. We wonder why they do ram raids and we wonder why people are now getting um, murdered in the streets. I hear you. We need change. Yep, we do. Guys, I want what a good session. Nui, you've done excellently. We'll have oh, you back, you. I think. <laughs> uh, I think we go, yeah, that's good. Uh, any random thoughts from either of you at the end of the week? What got you going this week, Nui? Oh, I think it was the OCR hikes and the, and the boot camps, I think, Dawn, which, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it yeah, got me going for a bit there. All right. Boise, anything else that has outraged you? Oh, I'm outraged uh, permanently this week. I'm outraged by the murder of a small business worker. Mm. I'm outraged by the fact that the mainstream media uh, can't report a fundamental um, and major change of knowledge from the UN in regard to climate change. Yeah. Uh, and I'm outraged by the fact that our Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister and uh, Megan Woods have no idea what's in the legislation or what's about to be passed through Parliament under urgency. Could, so I, I, I'm in a permanent state of purple outrage. I couldn't have said it better myself, which is why I had both you on today. Uh, Nuanthi <laughs> Samarakone and uh, Boise from the Backbencher Pub, uh, our Free Speech Friday panel.